Hello and welcome to the Roy Rogers News Channel. Thank you so much for watching. Before I dive into this broadcast, I would like to mention a brief statement. This publication is aimed to help people regardless if they are new or experienced. Stay tuned till the end to hear about a career path that could be taken for a financially secure lifestyle. Now I should note that this is not the only career path you can take on PokeMO. There are a lot of different career paths you can take. But out of all the career paths that I've seen featured on forums, I figured that this one is the one that may be easiest to do here on Pokemon. At least in my opinion, I think it's easy. So I'm going to feature it here on YouTube. But if you want other career paths, you can research that on your own. And I wish you well in that. And without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the money making tips listed in this publication right now. So let's go and start off with strategy number one. And that would be starting up a service. And I would like to thank Gurub for giving you permission to feature his shop. Now, what does he have in his shop that you can learn from? Well, he has his Discord ID present. He has his in-game name present. And he also has the fees present. Also, you may have noticed that his forms display name matches his in-game name. Now, this would be very helpful if you launch a forms account, because if you want to start up a service, you don't want the customer to have to jump through several hoops just to get to you. You want the customer to have an easy experience getting to you in game. So make sure that your display name matches your in-game name. And it could also open up a few doors in the future besides starting up a service, but that is just one of the many doors that it opens. Now I highly suggest that you start up a service here on PokeMO if you are starting out and you're looking for a way to make income while trying to establish connections. And I'm kind of giving a little bit of a teaser for the end of the video, but I just wanted to state that. Now, there are two different pathways you can do if you're going to start up a service. And I would like to kind of make it analogous to McDonald's for easier understanding. You can either do path number one, which is you start up a service and then you use it as a stepping stone to pay for your gym resources, then you can retire the service. And then once you have your gym resources and once you fight the gyms and all that, then you can eventually upgrade to GTL flipping and then you can retire the gym team. And this is analogous to if you're working at McDonald's and let's just say that you want something to put in your resume for the community college, this is just one more thing you can put in your resume that you are a disciplined worker at McDonald's. You can put your manager there as a reference and the community college says, hey, welcome to Bob's community college. And then eventually you get your degree and you can eventually work at a wonderful job that pays decently well. And then there's career path number two. You love the service. You don't want to retire the service and you want to continually level up and EV train people's Pokemon. And that is no problem at all because you can be able to upgrade your resources. Maybe instead of a level 100 Venusaur that you got from the start of the game and you've had Venusaur learn Earthquake and Sweet Sense so you can be able to summon hordes. You can upgrade that Venusaur to a Teddy Ursa with the ability pickup and then you can be able to get items passively while you conduct your service. So that is just one of the many examples you can do if you're going to pursue the starting up a service essentially for your in-game career. And that's all you want to do. Kind of like McDonald's. If you like working at McDonald's, you like the idea of cooking burgers or you like to be at the register and then you eventually get promoted to become a manager at McDonald's and get paid decently well. I know some people that have been managers at different chain areas and they get paid pretty well. That is a career path. And starting up a service, those are the two options that you have. So make sure to pick wisely, but don't be ashamed to start up a service if you're in game career and that's all you're known for. Don't be ashamed for that. I know people that love doing that and keep being you. And keep in mind that the more clients you have, the more money you can make. Hope that this helps you out. And without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into the next step. Just in case you're not really a people person, maybe you don't want to deal with the public, 
no problem. You can do payday grinding. Now, I should note that if the level of the Pokemon is level 47, for example, and you payday it, then you're going to get 470 Pokeyen at the end of that fight. Also should be noted that Payday will not stack. So if you fight against an NPC, if you use Payday on one Pokemon that is level 47, and then you use Payday on another Pokemon that's level 50, then you will get an additional 470 Pokeyen at the end of the fight, and you won't get 500 Pokeyen because you already used Payday on that one Pokemon. I just wanted to note that because a lot of people have been asking me about that in the past. But it should also be noted that you can make the calculation in your head how much money you can make at the end of the fight. All you have to do is just figure out what the level of the Pokemon is, and you can see it every time you encounter the Pokemon, and then multiply that number by 10, and then that's going to be the payout. It's very slow to make all that money. It's manageable, and you have to be disciplined. So make sure that you are up and you're paying every day. But is it really something I would suggest on a daily basis? Unless you have the spare time to do that, I would not suggest it for a long haul setting. Because trust me, you're probably gonna get bored and you might be wondering, is there more to Pokemon than just throwing coins at random wild Pokemon? So don't do it for a long period of time. Make sure that you split it up with several other activities that I can list here. But it is a possibility, and I still do it to a certain extent if I need to level up a Pokemon real slowly. But I don't do it in a long setting because I'm probably going to be driven crazy if I just sit there and payday all day. Also, you could battle NPCs or non-playable characters. And how do you know if you can battle an NPC? Very simple. They have a little bubble above their head. And if you fight that NPC, they could give you a certain salary. Now, as of the time of this taping, the two NPCs that pay you the most are the gentleman and the social light. I think that's what they're called. They're at Route 13 in Unova. Just go north of an Andela town and then go up north to Route 13. Then you should see the elderly couple there. Fight both of them. They pay relatively well. So you can do this every six hours and feel free to fight those NPCs. Now, if you lose against them, then you can always come back and fight that NPC until you win. Cooldown will activate once you win that fight. The next strategy is gym rematches. Now, I would not encourage you to jump into gym rematches right away. Make sure you have an idea of what you want to do. You might want to just scout players that fight gyms and see what they're using. You might even want to watch several YouTube publications. For example, my friends and colleagues, Rody Walk has mentioned a strategy. Petrowski mentioned a strategy on his broadcast. And I know several others that have featured a strategy on how to fight gyms. So make sure you can be able to watch those publications. They even mentioned TNUM's publication about the Flareon. I find that kind of creative in my opinion. Yeah, I think that there are a lot of different strategies that you can employ in terms of fighting the gyms. So make sure you do your own research prior to jumping into the gym rematches because making those resources are going to be probably one of the most expensive things you can do here on Pokemon. Though. Just keep in mind that the reset as the time of this taping is 18 hours after a victory. And if you lose, you can always come back and fight the gym leader again. So feel free to make those resources. And then if you want to spice up your life a little bit and you say, hey, you know, these gyms, eh, they're pretty milk toast. I want to go extreme. I want to fight the Elite Four. I was helping one guy several months ago and then he came back to me and he said, Roy, I know you told me to fight gyms, but this is too corny for me. I have to fight the Elite Four and I did. And you know what? I love it. And if you're that guy, then I'm happy for you. And if this sounds like you, excellent. Keep in mind that the reset is six hours after a victory. It is just like the NPCs. However, you're going to have to budget a lot. Now, thankfully, Alex has given me permission to feature his guide here. So feel free to read his guide. Now, for YouTube regulation reasons, I can't read his full name because I don't want this video to be taken down. 
but you can go ahead and take a look at that guide. He has even featured a spreadsheet, so I love the fact that Alex has done that. Good job for Alex. And also, Alex has even made a video publication that I would heavily encourage you to check out of him fighting every single Elite Four member and he even threw in Marmoto as a bonus. And I think he even threw in Cynthia. I'm not sure. But he threw in some extra fights at the end. And I think it might be very useful to you to see how he conducts himself in terms of fighting the Elite Four. If you ever want to pursue that line of work, I would not encourage you to fight the Elite Four once you complete the whole four regions. And uh, when Johto arrives, the whole five regions. I think you should wait a little bit see what the strategies are, and see if you can budget your team around losses, potential losses, revives, medicines, how much does this cost, how much does that cost, try to weigh certain things, and really perfect that Elite Four team if you want to pursue that line of work. Don't jump into it right away. You have to know what you're doing. Now let's go ahead and take it a bit easy and let's go ahead and dive into something that's a little bit more manageable. Now, do you remember the payday method that I mentioned that you can throw coins at every wild Pokemon? Suppose if you can throw payday coins and maybe pick up an item as a bonus. Well then, item farming is your strategy. And there are three different ways you can item farm. Item farm number one is you can pick up farm. So you use something like a Meowth and you use Payday. Then there's a chance you could pick up things like Nuggets and Pearl, etc, etc. Now, the Nuggets, the big Nuggets, you can sell those in the Pokemart and they can give you a good amount of cash to kind of get you by. And you can also Payday too, so hey, that's like two for the price of one. Or you can do item frisking. Now, some items are very valuable and when I did the Pokemon treasure hunting series, I talked about all the Pokemon with the ability Frisk. So if you want to check out that video publication, feel free to. But the Pokemon that I have is Bayonet. And I love my Bayonet because it Frisks different items and it is just spectacular. As I mentioned about Toxic Orb being quite valuable. And also you can farm your own leftovers and life orbs you don't have to go through with the battle points. And that's one of the strategies, but I can get to that later. You can item farm, and you can take all these valuable items away. And the Pokemon in the Pokedex can give you certain item yields. And actually, in my Pokemon Encounter Index, I even cited all the items you can get on a Pokemon. So, beside the Pokemon's name, you should see the item yield. So, for example, Mach can give you either Nugget, Black Sludge, or Toxic Orb, which sells for quite a bit because Gliscor and Breloom use them. Well, I should note that Breloom uses it for more PvE type stuff, but Gliscor uses it for more PvP type stuff. And the Toxic Orb appeals to both camps. So farm Toxic Orbs if you love item farming. You're probably gonna love being in a stack of Toxic Orbs because whenever you're down and out, you can always sell a whole bunch of them. Now, I don't have a whole bunch of Toxic Warps, but there are people out there that can just farm and farm and farm. And keep in mind that Muck is very difficult to farm from because Muck could have Sticky Hold, meaning that it's going to hold on to that Toxic Warp. You have to find a way how to get Muck to not have its Sticky Hold ability while at the same time not flinging the item at you. Now, thankfully, in the Pokemon Treasure Hunting series, I talk about a Bayonet strategy that can easily thwart Muck's attempts to do that. So feel free to check out that video if that appeals to you. If this doesn't sound impressive to you, well, then there's a third way you can farm items. XP candy from the Alphas. All right, so XP candy sell for quite a bit because of people that may want to do Nuzlocks or people that may want to level up certain Pokemon without having to worry too much when they do the story. So there's quite a bit of a demand for XP candy. So feel free to farm those from the Alpha Pokemon. Then they usually drop them after either knock out the Alpha Pokemon or after you catch the Alpha Pokemon. So 
you could be able to get those XP candies and sell them for quite a bit of some money in game. There is something else that I would like to talk about about alphas, but that comes much later in our broadcast. So to summarize, the item farming tactics, you can either do pickup farming, item fresking, or XP candy from alphas. Feel free to farm whatever you want to farm. And speaking about farming, let's go ahead and dive into berry farming. And before you dive into the berry farming, please check out Mighty Boxer's berry watering tips on forms because it's going to help you immensely. I mean, I don't want to see your berries wilt. And I know that you want to make money in games. So if you want to make money in game, you want to sell berries in bulk. And you can't do that if your berries wilt. So check out Mighty Boxer's berry watering guide. And he should be able to give you exact steps as to what you can do if the berry grows at X amount of hours. I should note that at the time of this taping, all wilt times are eight hours so make sure you set up your alarm clock to log in game some people log in during breakfast and then during dinner and you might want to orient your schedule around the berries otherwise all that money that you put into your berries is going to be wasted if you don't do that now let's just say that berry farming is not really your thing well in that case you can catch breeders now you can either catch breeders the conventional way. You can have some Pokeballs and then go into Rust Turf Tunnel and catch a bunch of Wismers because Wismer is both monster and field. Or you can do the Petrasky method. I think Petrasky came up with it, so I'd like to thank Petrasky for the Magikarp method he showcased on his channel. So what is the Magikarp method? Well, you go into Fuchsia City, and then you go into the Safari, and then you can catch the Magikarp via the old rod with the Safari Balls. You pay 500 Poke Yen as kind of an entrance fee, and then you can be able to catch your Magikarps, because each Pokeball costs 200 Poke Yen per ball. The Safari Zone entrance costs 500 Poke Yen per entrance. So you get 30 free balls, and you don't have to pay so much to get other Pokeballs. So that's the benefit to using Petrosky's Magikarp method. Now I should note that I didn't seek out permission from Petrosky to feature his Magikarp video. So I did not feature it here. I decided to feature a mock-up of what you can do from one of my alternative accounts. However, if you would like to hear more about the Magikarp advice in great detail, then I would heavily encourage you to check out Petrosky's Magikarp video down in the description below. So feel free to check it out if that is your cup of tea. You might be asking, hey Roy, so what else can I do besides catching breeders? And that's a good question. PokeMO has introduced alphas, and as a result of that, you can catch and sell alpha Pokemon. It should be noted that alphas can only breed with each other to keep the alpha status for the offspring. So that means if you want an alpha Magikarp, then that Magikarp has to breed with another alpha Pokemon in Magikarp's egg group in order for the baby to still have the alpha status. And some people want an alpha version of that Pokemon and you can be able to make some money off of the people trying to breed up their dream alpha Pokemon by selling those on the global trade link. Feel free to catch those alpha Pokemon, and if you don't want them, feel free to sell them in the global trade link. There are plenty of people who want them. And here's the thing about alphas. There are some people who love having the shiny alphas because they have a little yellow rim around them. Feel free to get those as well because those can sell for pretty good money on PokeML. So feel free to explore that method, and I wish you all well with catching and selling alpha Pokemon. Of note! Go ahead and check out Tinum's method of catching the Alpha Pokemon, and I am going to link his video down in the description below explaining how to catch an Alpha with a Contrary Spinda and with a Crobat as time of this taping, but he might change his second Pokemon depending on circumstances on PokeML. But the Spinda method, to my knowledge, looks to be timeless. So. You can at least use the Spinda method, but feel free to check out T-Nome's video down in the description below if you want to know how to construct a team around catching an Alpha Pokemon. 
And before I talk about strategy number 10, I must mention a disclaimer here. That the Roy Rogers News Channel does not take any responsibility for any gains or losses that you have made while exercising this method. Please use this method at your own discretion. The tenth method here is global trade link flipping, or GTL flipping as it's commonly called. Now, depending on the item or vanity, you could have varying levels of risk. And you should consider the profit margins because profit margins make or break your GTL flipping. Study the items and vanities worth before diving in. I know that some content creators make it look easy and that is because they have studied the items and vanities valuations prior to their dives. So make sure you do a lot of research prior to doing this exact method. Now, in game, I have a fair amount of friends that are pretty rich on PokeMO. I mean, they're a lot richer than me. And they do global trade link flipping almost on a daily basis. I mean, they spend like one or two hours just sitting at the PC computer and they just do flipping. And then they come back and they go to Vermilion and they have fun there, but they do global trade link flipping when they want to build up their income but there's a lot of risk to doing that, so make sure you do your research. And a helpful channel for you to watch is Shadow from Pokemon Investments, and I can link his channel down in the description below. Please, please, please do your research prior to doing this method. Now, let's go and dive into strategy number 11. And this is one of the most important methods you can do here to make money on Pokemon. And the method is pretty simple. Complete a region. And that's it. The end. All right, so let me go and give you why completing a region is so beneficial to you. So first, you have access to NPCs. Second, you have access to gyms. Third, you have access to new Elite Four battles. Fourth, you have access to new berry plots in some cases. Fifth, you have access to new item farming locations. And sixth, you have access to new Pokemon locations. As an example, you may want to build a PvP team. Now, before I go any further, I should note that this team is only built for demonstration purposes. I don't want people that are seasoned in PvP to say, Man, Roy's terrible at team building! That is not the purview of this video. Feel free to check out other YouTube channels or other resources for your team building strategies. So, I would like to cite four Pokémon as an example of my point of why you want to complete all the regions. So, let's just say that in Kanto, you want Arcanine in your Yu-Yu team. And then you want Spiritomb in your team. And then in Hoenn, you want a Flygon. And in Unova, you want a Durant. Those Pokemon are all region exclusives. So it would be advised if you can complete all four of the regions, and when Johto arrives, complete all five of the regions, because there might be a chance that a Pokemon in Johto might be easier to obtain than if you were to try to get that Pokemon in a different region. So make sure to do your research prior to trying to construct the PvP team. You might want to complete all four regions because it makes it a lot easier. I mean, you can use your level 100 Breloom, you can use False Swipe, it's Spore, and you can do all that jazz and try to catch the Pokemon, and it's going to be great. And that is a prime example of why you want to complete the regions that are presently available here on PokeML. You can also have access to new item farming locations, so let's just say that there are wild Pokemon that hold certain valuable items, I'm thinking of Garbodor, which could hold Black Sludge, Silk, Scarf, Nugget, or Big Nugget. So these are prime examples of why you want to complete all the regions, because you can have access to so many more resources that you probably would have not had access to otherwise. And before I go into my next strategy, I would like to make a recommendation for you. So while you're exploring the region, it would be advised to fight the NPCs that are there in the story. And one of the many reasons why you want to do that is maybe there are certain things that are time sensitive. Maybe you have to get to a location in a timely manner and those NPCs are blocking you, but you decide to NPC dodge. And then you, trying to get to the location in a timely manner, get encountered by five or six or ten NPCs and you don't want that. So that's why I like to fight every NPC that I can fight in the story so I don't have that problem. You don't have to have that problem either if you do that, but that is personal discretion. And I understand that there are some people on Pokemon that love speedrunning. If that's you, you do you. But 
if you want to be efficient on PokeML, then in my personal opinion, you should fight the NPCs while you do the story. And also it kind of helps with your experience and with your money. So that's why you want to fight the NPCs that are in your path while you're doing the story. And as for the next step, complete the national Pokedex for the ability patches. Now it should be noted that you don't have to complete all the Pokemon in the national Pokedex if you're focused on one specific region. So if you're in Kanto, you complete the national Dex in Kanto, or the Kanto Pokedex as it's called here, or the Hoenn National Dex, or in Sinnoh, the Sinnoh National Dex, or in Unova, the Unova National Dex. And you can chat with the assistant in the professor's office, and then you can be able to get the ability patch. But I would heavily encourage you to complete all the Pokemon in the National Dex, because that is going to help you significantly. And it should be noted that when you complete the National Pokedex, you are going to have access to a lot of information on PokeML, like the base stats of a Pokemon, where the Pokemon is, and the move sets of that Pokemon. So you could be able to access a lot of useful information. Now, if you don't have access to the Pokemon's information or the wild locations, well, I have you covered because I have a Pokedex guide on forms and I can link it down in the description below and I cite all the wild locations and evolution trees and I try to make it as easy as possible for you to be able to obtain said Pokemon. So I hope you enjoy looking at that resource because it took me quite a bit of some months to formulate that. And you can go ahead and use those patches for all sorts of Pokemon. So as a prime example, the ability patch that's water type, you can use that particular ability patch for Sheer Force for Alligator, because I know a lot of people love using Sheer Force for Alligator, and you can use things like Life Orb, Waterfall, Ice Punch, Crunch, etc. And I'll probably make a competitive analysis, but I want to wait until the meta is calm down because there's a lot of new stuff being added and my competitive analysis are going to be quite antiquated when i publish them so that's why i'm waiting quite a bit to make competitive analysis but just to give an example sheer force for alligator is a pretty scary pokemon to deal with so that is one of the many reasons why you want to have a water type ability patch or the grass ability patch which you all know about contrary superior or the chlorophyll venusaur and as for the ability patch that's fire type, you can use it on the Cyndaquil because the flash fire Typhlosions be used in gym run teams really well. Or give it a few years and maybe Pokemon might be balanced enough to have speed boost Blaziken and maybe the ability patch for the fire type can be able to have access to Blaziken. There are plenty of reasons why you might want to obtain those ability patches. And I don't care what type of patch it is. It is good to obtain those ability patches regardless. So hope you all enjoy using those patches. And let's go ahead and feature our next strategy here. Whenever an event is live, farm it for prizes. Oftentimes, events will yield certain loot crates. Try to collect as much as you can. Some crates could skyrocket in value over the years as a demonstration for this broadcast. So the goodie bag. As an example, last year was 2022. Let's go ahead and take a look and see the price of the 2022 goodie bag. Ah, it's AK right now. However, let's go ahead and look up a goodie bag from 2016, which is 38 mil. All right, that's quite a markup, isn't it? But as you hold on to these goodie bags, the values of each of those bags start skyrocketing in due time. And then you could eventually start to hoard all these bags and make a good amount of money. You can wait a certain amount of years. So feel free to hold on to those loot crates. Some people like to open them, some people don't. If you want to open them, my recommendation for you is to farm like crazy in the event and then open up only a select few crates. Keep farming the event, keep doing what you need to do. Keep trying to figure out how to get those goodie bags. Keep trying to figure out how to get those red envelopes or 
the presents, keep figuring out how to get those because those events are going to have the crates that might be valuable in a few years. So hold on to them and you might be very happy that you farmed those events a certain amount of years ago. And as for the next strategy that I'd like to talk about, I would like to discuss battle point farming. There are a lot of ways to farm battle points. Feel free to check out my guide on the matter. And as time of this taping, there are currently four ways you can be able to obtain battle points. Let's go and dive into that, shall we? So way number one is to defeat the Elite Four in either Kanto, Hoenn, Sinnoh, or Unova. This also works for Elite Four rematches after the story mode. And way number two is you can do PvP ranked matchmaking battles, and that can also give you battle points. The way number three is the battle to keep the legendary that you held. If you beat the challenger, then a thousand battle points will be awarded to you for fending off the challenger. So if you hold on to Mewtwo or Quaza or Arceus or Kelbio or whatever the legendary the development team decides to implement for Johto, if you decide to hold on to one of those legendaries, then you can be able to obtain a thousand battle points after each victory of trying to fend off your challengers. And for the last way, you can be able to win the trainer tower in Kanto or one of the battle point battle buildings in Hoenn. Now for the battle point battle buildings in Hoenn, you can be able to go seven rounds and you have to be able to win all seven rounds in order to obtain your battle point prizes. And it should be noted that each battle point prize accumulates. So as you keep winning more and more and more sets of seven, then you should be able to get more and more battle points. And it should cap around like 2,000 battle points if I recall. But you can be able to win those battle points and you can be able to go in with a pretty good team with the Battle Frontier. So make sure you can do that. And you can be able to use those battle points to purchase a Toxic Orb. And you can purchase the Flame Orb and the competitive items that people use in PvP on a regular basis. That is another way you can make money here on Pokemon is by the battle point farming. Let's go ahead and list the next money-making tip here in the money-making video here on Pokemon. Investments. And in particular, investments in certain asset classes. This could be risky due to uncertainty. For example, a vanity could fall out of favor. Now, the good news is that there is a website made by Cole Knightfills. I hope I'm saying your name correct. And thank you so much for making that website. You are awesome if you're listening. Thank you. And keep up the great work that you are doing on that website. So keep it up, man. And please donate to him because he is doing excellent work. And this guy, he has your best interest at heart in terms of trying to keep track of every single investment. So that way you can assess whether or not you want to take the risk of buying certain vanity classes or not. And I've seen older vanities decrease in price, and then I see other vanities increase in price. As an example of this, before the Shadow Bone Club was implemented, I remember the orange flame skull was more valuable than the blue flame skull. However, thanks to the Shadow Bone Club, that essentially skyrocketed the blue flame skull, and the orange one is actually cheaper now because there's no Shadow Bone Club. And maybe these super rich people can write to me and say to me, Roy, that's the wrong valuation. And you can go ahead and discuss that in, in the comments section below, and it can help out more viewers to read your comments debating the valuations of certain vanities. But I would encourage you to look at Cold Knight Phil's website before you look at the debates in my comments section. Now, it should also be noted that when certain people on forums or certain content creators talk about asset classes, they should always disclose their conflict of interest. That way you know why they're either pumping or they're trying to discourage you from getting that vanity. And just to use a real life example here, there are several guys at Wall Street that could go ahead and try to negotiate for the price to go down or negotiate for the price to go up. So you have to watch out for that and you have to make your own determinations. Don't just rely on one person's judgment. Ask two or three people about that particular vanity 
then make sure that person is on the up and up. And that is my suggestion to anyone that wants to get into this particular way to make money on PokeML. And keep in mind, you're doing this for the long term. You're not doing this for short term. If you want to do short term, then don't do investments because investments are just going to sit there in your bag for maybe two to five years or more. So make sure that you know that ahead of time and make sure that you take the necessary precautions prior to making those investments. All right, and then we have the next money-making strategy that I like to talk about, and this is a strat that I coined, and it is called the money-making sandwich. And how I would like to discuss this exact philosophy is you got the two buns at the top and bottom, and then in the middle, you have your wad of cash in the middle. Now, what is the money-making sandwich? Well, the money-making sandwich is at the top, you can do one activity, and then at the bottom, you can do a second activity. So to give an example here, you can do a gym run while evolving a Pokemon from the GTL to sell its evolved form. This implies that you are not in the coin boost. So make sure to do this when you're not boosting up your coins. And to give an example here, you can look at Dino. Now, I should note that I do not have Dino's listed on the global trade link. I should mention that now. But you can buy Dino for dirt cheap for like 1K. And you can evolve it into Hydreigon. And Hydreigon is 25K, as you can see there. So there's a pretty nice chunk of profit there. And you can keep doing this in increments. And you can keep buying all these pre-evolutions and evolving them. Because there are a lot of people who love Hydreigon or maybe love the Salamance or they love that particular fully evolved Pokemon. So make sure to do your own research prior to your level grinding for that particular Pokemon. And here's another example of the money sandwich. EV training for clients, and then while you're doing that, you buy a Pokemon from the global trade link to flip. But in order to flip it, you would EV train it alongside with your client's Pokemon. So let's just say your client wants 252 special attack, 252 speed, and you buy something else on the global trade link and you can EV train that too and then you can flip that on the global trade link while you wait for your client to pay you and then there you go that is the money sandwich at work so you're making money while doing another activity which makes you money it's kind of like a stock that pays you a dividend and grows at the same time it's kind of that particular philosophy except with the stock, you have to sell it. With this, you don't need to sell the stock in order to realize your gains. You can just have Pokemon there. You can just sell that Pokemon on the global trade link, and then you can be able to get money from your client, and you got your client there. And your client can give you more orders for more Pokemon that he or she has. So you can keep accumulating more and more funds. And I would say this is probably one of the safest ways to make money here on PokeML because it doesn't really involve much high level risk. And that's what I like about the money making sandwich. So make sure you can be able to pursue that if you would like to make a good amount of money in a safe way. And then for the next strategy, I would encourage you to save up. Now, my encouragement to you is this. If you are the type of person to splurge, well, then my solution to that is just open up an alternative account, give some money to that alternative account, and then park it there, don't look at it, and then you can keep making more and more money, and maybe you can keep mailing to the alternative account every time. You can be able to stow away funds for a rainy day fund. Speaking about a rainy day fund, that segues into my next strat. Go ahead and set up an emergency fund in case you need sudden financing. Think of all the times you want to jump in during a buyer's market. Now, when does a buyer's market occur? And that's a good question. Oftentimes you see a buyer's market when events start to launch because people need funds. People start dumping their great vanities because they need money to buy the newer stuff. And as a result of that, you can benefit from the buyer's market because you can just start buying, 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 buying. And then you can go ahead and hold on to those older vanities. And then when it's a seller's market, 
then you can be able to dump those vanities and you can make a good amount of money that way. And actually, I know some pretty super rich people that do this on PokeML on a regular basis. So make sure you have an emergency fund in case you want to be able to benefit from people dumping their vanities. And keep in mind that there is some risk involved, so make sure that you know what you're getting into prior. And the last strategy I would like to discuss is adaptability to change. And what this entails is learning what has changed on PokeML and acting upon said changes. This could even result in having to make new PVE resources. Now, PVE stands for player versus environment. So you might need to make new Pokemon as the changes start going by. Make sure that you are not like an old man, just completely locked in your ways and not willing to adjust your strategies. Once you lock into a method, then that's when failure can start to hit because almost every year throughout my time here as a player here on Poke ML, 2014 Poke ML is not the same as 2023 Poke ML. The only thing that I think is the same between both of those years is that starting up a service is quite a timeless concept. In fact, I mentioned it as the first method for that specific reason, because it's a timeless method and you don't have to really worry about the ebbs and flows of Pokemon updates, but you should keep your eyes open as to what things are changing around you on PokeML and make sure you adapt to them. Because if you don't adapt, then you're gonna be behind. Before I sign out of this money-making video here on PokeML, I would like to dive into some bonus content in this particular video. So a lot of people have asked me, hey Roy, how can I get myself established here on PokeML? And that's a very good question. And there's a step-by-step -step route that you can take. And I should note that there are a lot of different ways you can make yourself established, but I wanted to cite this way because this way, in my opinion, is a lot easier than the other ways cited. But feel free to do your own research if you disagree with this method. But let's go ahead and dive into the steps, shall we? So step number one is bring the guides in the guide tavern and Teddy support page. And I try to make your life easier. So I have on my forms profile and my about me page, my guide index and I have guides listed. And then under the second spoiler, I have guides that I didn't author, but I thought they'd be helpful to you so you can be able to know about the things going on in PokeML. And also I would heavily encourage you to watch my friends and colleagues on YouTube. So I'm going to suggest that you watch MT Birchfield's content. I'm going to encourage you to watch Rody Walk's content, Petrasky and Moxie Mazi and T-Nums, Gix Mergen, and Rimmel, and Shadow from Pokemon Investments, and many, many others. And you can watch their content and hopefully you can be able to be briefed as to how to be a proper player here on Pokemon and how to navigate through the stuff here in game. So feel free to watch their content and you should be a better informed player after you get done watching their video content here on YouTube. And I would like to thank them all for contributing quite a bit to PokeML with their content and making the lives of so many players a lot easier. So thank you everybody that makes content to PokeML. Thank you for your contribution here to the PokeMMO help space. But what's the next step? After you brief yourself up on the information, then I would try to figure out how to launch a forms account and make sure your display name matches your in-game name. Once your forms account has been launched, I would want to start making money on PokeML, but I also want to establish connections. And how would I do that? Very simple. I would start up a service because if I start up a service and I make my money and at the same time, I establish friendships on PokeML, which could eventually help out my career path later down the line. So starting up a service, fulfills both of those needs. Now, before launching the service, I would need to level any story Pokemon with spread moves to level 100. This could be either my starter or something like a Nino King with Earthquake. And if you have the Nino King with Earthquake, go ahead and catch an Oddish out in some route. I mean, Oddish is pretty common or catch anything with Sweet Scent. And Sweet Scent's even a TM now, so you can be able to check what Pokemon can learn Sweet Scent and, and teach the Pokemon there. Although I should know if 
you want to upgrade your Pokemon, you can. You can actually upgrade it to Teddy Ursa with a spread move and sweet scent and pickup. So you can be able to utilize Teddy Ursa in that setting. So my service can be launched since my resources are ready. As service gets more popular, I can use the extra income to upgrade my resources, as I mentioned earlier with Teddy Ursa, replacing Onish with Teddy as an example. All right, I mentioned that before. Let's go ahead and dive into our next step. While conducting my service, I would try to join a reputable team to become their personal EV trainer and leveler. I would then ask politely if someone could loan a gym team for me to use. Now, if I get a rejection, then my goal is to continually save up. However, if I'm accepted, then I would try to learn the ropes while generating a new income stream. Once I make enough wealth for my own team, then EV training or leveling service can be retired. So I don't need to EV train or level since at this point I make more money doing gym runs than I do conducting an EV training or leveling service. And then, while doing gym rematches, I would try to research items, Pokemon, and vanities for their valuations. I would try to learn how to flip on the global trade link while not doing gym reruns, because there's an 18-hour timer there, and what can you do for 18 hours? You can do research, and you can try to see what sort of items go and what sort of items don't go so fast. You can be able to assess your... GTL flipping skills. And then, once you generate enough income to flip on the global trade link, then gym rematches can be retired with an asterisk. Because you might want to keep that gym team on standby just in case if you get a global trade link flip failure. And that could happen. So make sure you have your gym team on the ready. Don't sell your gym team until you're absolutely sure that you can be able to make a lot of money with the flips. And after you get done researching item valuations and after you get the hang of flipping, then you can pursue the dream. You can either pursue shiny hunting or PVP without having much financial troubles. And I know a lot of people in PokeML that do this. They don't have any financial trouble and they just PVP to their heart's content or they shiny hunt to their heart's content. And you can do this too. I knew someone on PokeML that had a service, skipped the gym rematch step, but that person has done research on the item valuations, the Pokemon valuations, and the Vandy valuations, and then this person decided to retire the service because this person makes a lot more money GTL flipping than essentially conducting the service. And you can be able to go in that path too if you would like, but it's a lot harder because it is much slower, but you can do it though and you can dedicate a few hours of your day just global trade link flipping once you're at that step and i would like to reiterate this that the roy rogers news channel does not want to take credit for any profits or losses that you have made while doing the global trade link flipping and you might want to assess your risk level but it is possible and you could be able to make money on poke mo if you decide to execute your global trade link flips correctly. Before I sign out, I have a plea for you all. If you enjoyed content like this, then feel free to give me a super thanks. There's a little heart there with a dollar sign. And you can go ahead and adjust however much you think that I deserve. And I would appreciate if you give me a tip. Or if you didn't give me a tip and you just write me a comment about my strategies, you can do that too. And I'd appreciate that as well. And also, if you'd like to join in a Roy Rogers News membership, then feel free to do that 99 cents a month and you can help contribute to my production expenses and i would appreciate you all for considering that option and let me just reiterate this please watch my friends and colleagues on youtube i have them all in my pokemo channel index there and feel free to check them all out and then you can be better informed as a player make sure that you do your own research and then go ahead and pursue the dream and with that i'm going to go ahead and sign off this is the Aurora Rogers News Channel. Don't forget to comment and subscribe to the channel. I can update you here. And this is the Aurora Rogers News Channel signing off. Fast, accurate, biased, Roy Rogers News.